Hello, this is Cynthia Sue Larson with RealityShifters.com and today I'd like to talk with you about viruses, memory, and the Mandela Effect. Because right now, of course, we're facing the coronavirus pandemic worldwide and um, I'd like us to think for a minute about the relationship humans have with viruses. It's a little bit surprising and there's some good news. We can glean amazing insights from viewing the way that memories and viruses work and recognize that there are apparently some long standing history between viruses and humans, in fact all mammals, uh, because an international collaboration of scientists and researchers working together from the University of Utah, the University of Copenhagen, and the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology in the United Kingdom discovered something surprising about a molecule in our brains called ARC, A-R-C. And this is a protein that's very essential for memory, as it turns out. Apparently we can't really form long-term memories without it. And that's not so surprising in and of itself. What is surprising is that this arc appears to have its roots some 350 to 400 million years ago um, in some ancestor of the retrovirus. Because the way that, um, that, that this is shaped, this arc protein, is very much... Um, like uh, a virus. It's, it's shaped with the same kind of packaging, if you will, where it, it encapsulates certain things. And that's how it moves around and interacts with the body and the brain. And so little is known about ARC's molecular function and evolutionary origins, but we're starting to get a little bit of a, a sort of a genetic trail or track, <laughs> if, you, if you will. And so using electron microscopy, scientists realized that the way ARC assembles itself appears very similar to the way the HIV retrovirus operates. So that was the tip-off originally that led the researchers to look closer. And if you look at my blog, um, which is the companion to this video, you can see all the resources, references, and links. But this ARC protein does behave just like a virus in the sense that it serves as a platform, allowing neurons to communicate with one another. And scientists found that when they looked at mice that were lacking this ARC protein, they had difficulty remembering things that they had learned even just one day earlier. So the brains um, lack plasticity that don't have this ARC protein. That, uh, therefore, they can't really absorb new knowledge and skills or have memories. And so when we look at the way that we're evolving with viruses, this is where I'd love to bring up another idea because actually virologists are noticing that the original novel coronavirus, COVID-19, almost immediately mutated into three different strains. Within a few weeks, it was observed by scientists in Iceland to have over 400 mutated versions. Um, they're not all stable, so it looks like researchers will be tracking the ones that are stable. But what I'd like to focus on is that when you look at these viruses, and you look at the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is a beta coronavirus, which means it's in the family with SARS and MERS, the coronavirus, it has a structure that's easily recognized by biologists as being 80% similar to those. And originally, um, coronaviruses like these had been considered to only affect birds and mammals, but these epidemics of SARS, MERS, and COVID-19 are demonstrating this family can jump from between species barriers and spread to humans. And here I'd like to get into the work of William S. Burroughs. He's an author, and he had the idea that words themselves are like a virus. And he said that because they can have an effect. They probably did affect the way that humans speak. They, we've changed the way we move our mouths and everything. Author Philip K. Dick took this a little bit further, and he commented on this um, revelation by saying, I cannot accept Burroughs' view that we've been invaded by an alien virus, an information virus. Yet on the other hand, I cannot readily dismiss this bizarre theory as mere paranoia on his part. I'm reading that part because it's kind of entertaining. It turns out that these viruses apparently have been influencing human evolution for a long time. So they really do compose quite a bit of our genetic makeup and they get built right into who we are. And we assume that we're just how we've always been, but actually we've changed. And Philip K. Dick continues on. He says, where Burroughs and I sharply disagree is that my supposition is that if information life form exists, 
It's a, a life form of information. And this is a bizarre and, and wild supposition. This, this is Philip K. Dick. It must be benign. It does not occlude us. On the contrary, it informs us. Or perhaps it has no interest in doing either, but simply rides our own information traffic, using our media as a carrier. That is entirely possible. That I myself saw this living information in the spring of 1974 is not something I wish to claim. On the other hand, I will not deny it. The issue is important, vital, and also elusive. If you grant an occluding information virus, are you not then yourself occluded in your very analysis of it, as well as your perception of its existence? There is a paradox involved. I'm sure you can see that. So that was Philip K. Dick. He did have an extraordinary epiphany in 1974. It led him to start noticing the sorts of things we call Mandela effects today. He was noticing it in the 1970s. He was writing about it. He did movies about it. He wrote The Man in the High Castle, which is now a whole series that you can watch about a whole parallel reality that he believed was real. So when we look at Mandela effect affected memories, we can see that much of what we consider ourselves to be comes from memories of who we think we are and the stories that we believe we're living in. Without these kinds of long-term memories, we wouldn't be who we think we are. We, wouldn't, uh, we would end up, um, hypothetically, eternally in the moment, free from expectations of ourselves or others, likely devoid of, of much in the way of long-term plans. And this is where it's really fascinating, because this is where I see that our very sense of self, like who I think I am, who you think you are, comes from this ability to have these long-term memories. And this may all be thanks to an ancient virus. Scientists note that eukaryotic genomes are littered with DNA of viral or transposon origin, which compose about half of most mammalian genomes. That was research from 1999, 20 years ago, but it's been proven to be what we know to be reality right now. So this is extraordinary. I wanna wrap up by looking at the Mandela effect and noticing that when it comes to this Mandela effect, many of us recall different historical events, as well as differences in just about everything in existence, including human physiology, plants, animals, books, foods, movies, music, names, places, buildings, people, aircraft, cars, and more. Pretty much everything. Clearly, we're still finding fundamental processes by which information storage in the brain operates. And we have yet to discover biological mechanisms that would support our ability to witness these reality shifts, these Mandela effects, these quantum jumps, these miraculous changes. When we look at nature through a quantum lens, this is what I love to do, you know that. All my videos get into it pretty much. We can see evidence that natural systems have already been doing these seemingly impossible things, thanks to what I believe is quantum physics being intrinsic in everything in nature. Um, these natural organisms can do things such as bacteria can organically mutate their entire organism in one generation, a single generation of bacteria. We can see astonishingly high levels of efficiency uh, in photons um, being processed in the whole principle of uh, photosynthesis in all of our plants. We can see amazingly accurate navigational systems demonstrated by robins and perfect synchronization of starlings in flight that move just like some kind of quantum fluid. We can gain from such observations insights into the rich mystery of mind-matter interaction guiding further investigations with my favorite question of all time, how good can it get? So I'd love to leave you thinking about all these connections and maybe there are some good things coming out of all of this. I think there always are, so keep looking for it. <laughs> Until next time, this is Cynthia Sue Larson.